Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 299, cover dated April 1993. This cover by Brandon Peterson and Dan Panosian, featuring the return of the upstarts, Games Master there, holding up a, what we call it, chess piece of Bishop. And in the background, Shinobi Shaw and Trevor Fitzroy. So the caption here, players and pawns. So let's open this one up to take a look at our splash page, uh, which maybe surprisingly features Forge. We haven't seen him in the title since issue 290. And um, he's here examining some uh, rock and metallic wreckage. And where could it be that he is and who's this behind him wearing those jean shorts? Well, if we turn the page over, we have a double page half uh, splash with Henry Peter Gyrick of the National Security uh, Council and Forge and then they're Kuwait, they're in Kuwait and they are examining the wreckage of Asteroid M and the mystery is how could it have entered Earth's atmosphere and arrived in, without having been burnt up uh, to a crisp um, on re-entry. So as Forge concludes, it's as if something or someone guided these remains through the planet's atmosphere. So the title of the story is Nightlines and the creative team is Scott Lobdell Ryder, Brandon Peterson Penciler, Dan Panosian Inker, Chris Eliopoulos Letterer and Marie Javins Colorist. So one of the uh, workers here um, on site uh, calls out to Gyrick to come quickly that they've found something. So they enter down into the uh, innards of the uh, asteroid and we see all this wrecked, wrecked equipment here. And let's turn the page and see what is it they discover. Little shades of Indiana Jones and um, Raiders of the Lost Ark here with some of this. And this guy casts some light into the uh, inner chamber and what is revealed in this anchor image except unsettlingly uh, Magneto's armor and uh, it is uh, as if it's been broken through uh, by someone uh, so has Magneto apparently or well, presumed dead uh, has he had his body taken from the armor or has he somehow removed himself from the armor and there is here these uh, frozen um, uh, figures of the acolytes Anne-Marie and Delgado as well bowing, uh, kneeling uh, uh, before uh, the vacated armor of uh, Magneto. So it's a mystery. And then the scene switches and to New York City and ABC News Studios. So a lot of this issue is focused on a late night debate, a three-way debate uh, with Professor X uh, as uh, invited as an expert on genetics and also in his new guise as a mutant rights activist. And um, here we have this interesting bit as they're uh, coming into the studios and another of the debaters is Senator Robert Kelly who appeared at the end of the previous issue. And he's got an aide here, this uh, black man who smiles uh, knowingly at Jean and Professor X um, as they engage in their telepathic dialogue. And who is this guy? Well, we'll see a little bit more with him at the end of the issue. And so the dialogue between Jean and uh, Professor X continues um, because the th they're concerned about the third member of the debate uh, seen here for the first time, Graydon Creed who's the leader of the Friends of Humanity. Professor X uh, explains here in his telepathic dialogue with Gene, a grassroots hate group that cloaks its message of racial intolerance in respectability by hiding behind the First Amendment right to free speech. Um, and Gene says, I've read about the man, came out of nowhere, incredibly charismatic. And Professor X says, which makes him all the more dangerous, Gene. That charisma enables the friends to hide in plain sight, allowing him the popular support of the people. Yesterday's tragic confrontation upstate with the acolytes only provides Creed with fuel to spread on the flames 
of the anti-mutant hysteria that is spreading across the country. So this is what Lobdell is doing. Um, he's picking up on that theme of Claremont's of uh, uh, anti-mutant racial prejudice, bigotry and intolerance. And he's returning to that theme um, at this point in his run on the title. So this is a very wordy issue, lots and lots of words in the debate uh, between the three. And I'm not gonna read out all of the dialogue, I'll just uh, focus on some of the key points as I go through the issue. So the debate gets going, it's a special edition of Nightline, the title of the special edition, Mutants, the Genetic Time Bomb. And um, we have here watching uh, um, in St. Mary's Boys Home, uh, Ted, the uh, mutant with uh, Down syndrome, the child who was rescued by the X-Men in the previous issue uh, from the Acolytes uh, being watched over uh, by Archangel. And um, he puts Ted to bed and then the uh, mother superior um, um, arrives in. And I like this, I always like this little feature of indicating when characters are whispering that the border of the speech um, balloon is uh, broken. So they're whispering here while Ted's asleep and um, she addresses him, uh, you are the one they call the Archangel. And um, he, sa he, he says to her, um, I'll be gone by the time they arrive, the police, if she's called the police on him. But she says, so not everyone believes that all mutants are to be feared and hated. The, there are those of us who are grateful to the X-Men for risking their lives on our behalf. Faith is important, but it's comforting to know with certainty that angels truly do walk among us. Um, Archangel here, um, pleased with what she says, but personally troubled, thinking that, uh, saying to her that sometimes he thinks he's beyond redemption, but the, uh, the nun says to him, there's no such thing. And then we see the debate uh, continuing on television and uh, Graydon Creed saying, if the government won't defend the common man, then it's time we defended ourselves. And so Archangel tells the nun that she should pray, pray for every one of us as he flies out uh, the window of uh, the, um, the home. And then we're back to the uh, studio for the debate. And as I said, a lot of words on the page here. Also, you know, I like Brandon Peterson's art here, but I don't think uh, he really handles this talking heads aspect of this particular issue um, um, as well as another artist might do. Um, it's stretching um, his ability at this time in his career uh, to be interesting because we're seeing a lot of the same angles on faces. Um, it's a tough gig for any artist to make talking heads interesting. He's doing his best, but it's not playing to his strengths, uh, this particular uh, um, assignment for him. Um, and this is his last issue of um, X-Men as well, um, before he jumps ship to Image. And um, here, the, uh, the debate uh, compare uh, puts the point, uh, could it be Professor to Professor X that there are admitted, admittedly questionable actions uh, those of the Acolytes and other um, uh, groups such as the uh, previously such as the MLF and uh, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants uh, are a justifiable response. Um, sorry, sorry, hold on a second. It is, uh, he's making the point about, uh, he's trying, he's making a point about the friends of humanity's willingness, in some cases eagerness to violate the civil rights of anyone who does not fit their rather limited definition of human. And the uh, debate compare says, could it be professor that their admittedly questionable actions are a justifiable response to the ever growing number of anti-human factions among the homo superior population? These acolytes, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the Mutant Liberation Front are but a few. And Professor X um, butts in and says, are but a few of the high profile mutants who regrettably get the lion's share of media attention. Perhaps if the press were more inclined to focus on the exploits of other mutants, such as the X-Men, who've served the world on more than one occasion, or remembered that there are many mutants who live quite peaceful lives, who go to work every day, who care for their families and yet live in fear that people like Mr. Creed's associates will rip every inalienable right from them simply because of who they are. 
So Professor X um, being quite assertive in this debate. And then we get a bit from Senator Kelly here. And this marks um, a turning point for Senator Kelly, who's always been um, a forceful um, proponent of uh, stern, draconian uh, laws uh, to, for example, register mutants with the government uh, for public safety. And Lobdell here begins to uh, moderate uh, Kelly's politics. So Kelly responds to Creed and he says, Mr. Creed, I must say, I resent. Oh, yeah, this is uh, important to point out that Creed makes the point the professor is being disingenuous, which is keeping, which is in keeping with his reputation as an apologist for mutants. I think we'd be curious to hear Senator Kelly's feelings about the X Men, the outlaws responsible for the death of his wife. And Professor X thinks that's not true, but how do I counter his disinformation without revealing the connection of my students? Um, the, he's referring to the death of um, Sharon Kelly in um, Uncanny X-Men 246 and 247. And this is interesting from Kelly. He uh, makes the point here. Mr. Creed, I must say, I resent that you've used a, my personal tragedy for a clever, sensational soundbite. Yes, my wife was killed in the midst of a mutant incident that included, among others, several X-Men. But there is no conclusive evidence that any X-Men in particular were responsible. It would be easy, comfortable to paint me as a bitter, revenge-crazed man bent on punishing all mutants for the acting of a handful, actions of a handful. I have not, and never will, advocate the blanket extermination of any race, mutant or otherwise. Genocide as a political agenda is as wrong today in countries like Bosnia and Somalia as it was in Germany over 50 years ago. While I am all for finding a way to control the more scurrilous genetically challenged, and I believe in that without equivocation, without hesitation, it is vital we do so with trampling on their rights as American citizens. So Professor X is in agreement with um, Kelly, and he reveals the fact that the leaders of this country declined to implement the Mutant Registration Act, which was Kelly's act that he put through the Senate, that's interesting because that goes back to the time of uh, Fall of the Mutants um, uh, crossovers um, in 1987. So here we are in 1993 getting confirmation that the Mutant Registration Act uh, never was implemented um, in the X uh, universe and mythos. So the debate continues and who else is watching someplace else? Uh, except the upstarts. We haven't seen them since Liam Portacio left uh, the Xbooks for Image. And here we have Fabian Cortez uh, throwing a tantrum because it's revealed that Graydon Creed is a member of the upstarts. Now that information was also available via the X-Men trading cards and Strife strike file, uh, but we're getting it in story for anyone any reader who didn't have uh, either Strife Strike File or the X-Men trading cards. So uh, Cortez is uh, disgusted at this. He says he's done nothing to prove himself worthy while I have. And Shinobi Shaw and Trevor Fitzroy fill in for him. Murdered Magneto, yes, we know, they say together. And um, they give us a little background on the various things they've done um, as part of the competition they're all embarked in. And then we get a little bit of um, an explanation as regards what the whole upstarts uh, uh, competition is about. Need I remind you, says Shinobi Shaw, as he gets ready to pour himself a drink, we formed this competition because we thought it would be fun. The upstarts were founded as escapist fare of the highest order, a brief respite from the sheer tedium inherent in massive wealth and power. I for one say that if we're not going to enjoy a perpetual game of one-upmanship, then why bother? So this uh, mollifies um, Cortez and then the uh, games master um, intervenes and says that, uh, that the mutant Fitzroy has been molding for membership, sorry, the mutant Fitzroy has been molding for membership will be the final member of the upstarts. So there'll be uh, five of them in total. And this takes Fitzroy by surprise. What, I've told no one about her? How? There is nothing I don't know, Trevor, says Games Master. It's part of my charm. And she, we will see for the first time in X-Men Unlimited number one. 
So then we're back to the TV debate and we have a little replay of Professor X being shot by Strife in Central Park um, some weeks earlier. And the TV um, host says, I'm sure I echo the sentiments of civilized people everywhere, Professor, when I say, we're grateful you've made a full recovery from that assassination attempt. But you must be aware there are others who are asking, hasn't he learned his lesson? You've done your part. You said what you felt had to be said and it almost cost you your life. Are you not going to be satisfied until you become a martyr for a cause that isn't even yours? So of course, at this point um, in time, the public does not know that Professor X is a mutant himself. Uh, they simply think of him as an expert in genetics um, and the founder and principal of his school for gifted youngsters. And uh, Professor X's response here is interesting. The only thing more frightening than dying, Elton, is living in a world where one man is too frightened to help another. So this is Professor X's big humanistic speech here. I must also object to your contention that this cause is not my own. A person does not need to be black to understand apartheid is wrong. People of all religions are rightfully horrified and repulsed by the crimes perpetrated against the Jews during the Holocaust. Similarly, one need not be a victim of AIDS in order to have compassion for the hundreds of thousands of people, those who have suffered and those who have died from this disease. When the time comes that people are restricted to helping their own is the day I believe there will be no hope for any of us. And Senator Kelly finds himself in agreement quietly. He says he finds himself agreeing with much of what Professor X has said. Graydon Creed though is not convinced. He says, look out your window gentlemen, it's an ugly dangerous place out there. And so the debate continues. And then we um, turn our attention to the X Mansion and we've got Peter Rasputin, Colossus here, uh, back doing some sketches as he watches the debate too. And we've got some coughing behind him and who or what is it except for his little sister Ileana, de-aged after the end of Inferno and uh, brought from Siberia by Peter and the X-Men after the murder of their parents in the story told in X-Men issue 17 to 19, that's adjectiveless X-Men. You'll find video review commentaries on those issues on the channel. So Ileana is there and she's brought him this nice little note, I love Peter. And uh, so we have this moment between them as she dozes off to sleep again. But what is the nature of that ominous cough that Ileana has picked up? Then we're back to the TV studio and we have one more uh, guest entering the debate, and that is uh, the Beast, Henry McCoy, uh, member, former member of the Avengers, and therefore a public celebrity and uh, well-loved by the public. And uh, Beast takes a ridiculing attitude to Graydon Creed, and um, he says here, uh, and a hearty seek heil to you, Mr. Creed. Poke fun if you like, Dr. McCoy. I'm a racist, he continues. It would take more, it would take a more ignorant man than me to argue such a point. And he continues on with his ridiculing of Creed and uh, the friends of humanity, um, ultimately ending his ridicule uh, by blowing a raspberry at Creed, which gets naturally enough under Creed's skin. And uh, it's time for uh, them to go to uh, an ad break. And then we um, switch scene to Harry's Hideaway, recently rebuilt during the night by Beast and Archangel. And we've got most of the gold team there uh, with uh, Charlotte Jones, who is Archangel's girlfriend. And they're watching the debate too and enjoyed Beast's uh, 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 ridicule of Creed. And in the midst of this, Bishop spies um, the waitress and um, thinks to himself, uh, there is something familiar about her, about her. So who is this woman? Um, and why does uh, Bishop think that he recognizes her? He thinks here, but I won't be born in this timeline for another 70 years. I can't possibly know her, can I? And there she is again at the end as he's looking sideways at her. At the time I read this first back in 1993, I thought, okay, this is gonna be his great grandmother or something like that. But it does turn out that she does become identified much later on after Age of Apocalypse in Lobdell's Run. Something to note here though, that 
Lobdell, unlike Claremont, did not plot uh, up ahead, years ahead um, of where he was going. And Lobdell would throw in these kinds of characters with no idea of um, who they were or what he would do with them later. But he was seeding them um, in his issues uh, so that there would be something for him to do up ahead if he needed to. Um, that was his narrative uh, strategy, not long-term plotting, but this kind of uh, narrative device. So here Aurora makes a toast to all their dead colleagues and even um, enemies, including Magneto and the Hellions. And then she ends the toast with to the, f uh, to the future, which Bishop, uh, um, with his Dr. Pepper says, indeed, wondering about the waitress. And then we're back to the TV studio and uh, the debate picks up for concluding statements. And, um, and here we have a rapprochement between Professor X and Senator Kelly. And Kelly asks him, can we get dinner? Can we get together for dinner while I'm in town tomorrow perhaps? But Professor X says, another time, I'm afraid I'm off to France at first light, a field trip with my students. And Jean thinks, I never thought I'd see the day these two would sit down and talk, welcome to the 90s. And then we're on our last page and Jean gets a surprise because she's telepathically uh, spoken to by someone else in the room. Actually, Miss Gray says the telepath that Senator isn't the monster everyone thinks he is, not once you get to know him. And who could it be? It's our black gentleman friend here. And again, he's a character that Lobdell, when he put him in here, didn't have a plan for him, but ultimately a plan uh, or use is made of the character in upcoming issues of Wolverine and Deadpool. And here we have Jean asking uh, Professor X about France. And the professor says, yes, the culmination of the matter that has monopolized my attention these past few weeks. I was in sonic contact with Scott throughout the telecast. We are now ready to make our move. So we saw Professor X in the previous issue, um, sequestered with Cerebro scanning for 72 hours, um, uh, 73 hours, three days without um, a break. What has he been up to? Well, he's gonna explain it here. So the Blackbird is primed and fueled. Uh, Scott is outside, Cyclops is out to collect the Professor. And uh, they should be in the air within the hour. And why are we going to France, asks Jean. And Scott says, because all the evidence indicates it's the base of operations of the Acolytes, we're taking the battle to them. So, okay, so here we're gonna see the X-Men not in reactive mode, but in aggressive, um, active mode. And they're going to strike the Acolytes in their base. So, I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 299. If you did, please like the video. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.